In this video, I'll go over the recent update from NASA on the program planning and preparations for upcoming Artemis missions to the moon. There's a lot of information when you get past the sound bites and the sensational headlines. You know, if you're into that kind of thing, like me. This is the next episode on the update from NASA Exploration Leadership to one of the oversight panels they report to a few times every year. In the last one, I focused on some of the pictures included in the briefing. Sometimes it's useful to say those thousand words about a picture out loud, so if you're interested in that exercise, I'll link to that in the upper right. In this episode, I'll go through what we learned about the status for the Artemis II mission. NASA leadership in the Exploration Systems Development Mission Directorate, ESDMD for short, made public presentations to the NASA Advisory Council Human Exploration and Operations Committee on Friday, April 26th. Catherine Kerner, the Associate Administrator of ESDMD, and Amit Shatriya, Deputy Associate Administrator of the Moon to Mars Program Office under ESDMD, made presentations that provided updates on the Artemis program's work and the status of planning and preparations for the next Artemis missions. The HEO Committee of the NASA Advisory Council typically meets three times a year, and it is one of the more valuable briefings that NASA leadership provides in public. A couple of reasons for that, in my opinion, are, first, that the briefings are directly from the NASA technical leadership. Second, they are for an industry audience, something that is a much more scarce commodity today. From a spectator point of view, that means some of the presentations might be a little harder to understand, but that also usually means that they cover more ground. There's more bang for the buck, so to speak, because there's an assumption that the audience knows or is more than familiar with the subjects. For Artemis II, which is the next mission, the current status is already pretty well known and we're still waiting to see when these next higher level milestones will happen. Exploration Ground Systems, or EGS, is still working on mobile launcher and launch pad verification and validation, getting closer to completion of that work at Launch Pad 39B at the Kennedy Space Center in Florida. Earlier in the year, the ML was projected to roll back from the pad to High Bay 3 of the Vehicle Assembly Building in the late spring. In the briefing, it was reported that they are hoping to do that in the mid to late June time frame, which is kind of the same thing at the end of spring. The SLS hardware for Artemis II is basically complete and awaiting transportation to the vehicle assembly building for stacking. EGS received almost all of the solid rocket booster hardware last year, and that is ready to begin stacking. The schedule for stacking is still to be determined or to be announced. The SLS second stage, the Interim Cryogenic Propulsion Stage, or ICPS for short, is in storage at Cape Canaveral Space Force Station waiting to be turned over to EGS. The rest, the core stage and the two connecting adapters, the launch vehicle stage adapter and the Orion stage adapter, are still off-site and need to be shipped to the Kennedy Space Center for handover to EGS. I went over in more detail what information was public knowledge about the status of Artemis 2, 3, and 4 about a month ago. I'll put a link to that in the upper right in case you're interested in more background. The presentations did include a few new images that I went over in more detail in the last video. Running through the ones specific to Artemis 2 summarily here, we got a new shot of ICPS-2 in presumably a vertical storage cell in United Launch Alliance's Delta Operations Center at Cape Canaveral Space Force Station. There was also a previously unseen image in the presentation of the Orion stage adapter with the centerline docking target installed in the middle of the diaphragm. The Orion for Artemis 2 is still the critical path for the schedule, and NASA Public Affairs reported last week on a milestone that was completed over that same weekend of April 27th, 28th, that the spacecraft completed electromagnetic interference and electromagnetic compatibility testing in the altitude chamber. It was lifted out of the altitude chamber and moved back to the final assembly systems test cell, FAST cell for short, in the industrial operations zone of the Neil Armstrong Operations and Checkout Building at KSC. There were three issues being investigated by the Orion program that we are aware of after the mission was delayed to September 2025 back in early January. The behavior of the base heat shield during the Artemis 1 atmospheric reentry was first noted in public in March of last year, 2023, but then when the delay was announced in January, we also heard about two other issues. 
A bad circuit design was discovered last year that affects multiple digital motor controllers on the spacecraft. And then an issue with the crew module batteries was discovered during a qualification test in December. In the briefing, Mr. Shatria clarified that the circuit cards that needed to be fixed as a result of the issue found with Orion Digital Motor Controllers will be installed now, in between the EMI-EMC tests just completed and the upcoming vacuum tests in the altitude chamber planned for the summertime. He also provided more detail and clarity about the issue with the batteries. We found a, you know, off nominal mode uh, at the, and the, again, Mike, to your point earlier, the kind of corner case of the box, the separation shock event um, during abort, um, and also that we would be exposed to this vibrational mode during uh, nominal CMSM separation in some cases. Um, during those cases, the mode was high enough that it induced an oscillation in the, in the, in the battery stack up. Which would which would have caught which caused some of the connectors in the battery to lose connectivity, um, and so in that particular case, what we need to do, I mean, this this is a must work system in an abort case, and so we need to fix it. And so that's what we're doing. Um, when the when the vehicle comes out of the of the of the, of the altitude chamber, we have a we have a fix in place. Um, we're also looking at um, you know potential diversion. The team hasn't finally settled on the exact solution to cut in the cut in the batteries, but they have settled on the fact that they have to fix it. So, so the question is, do we divert in the, the subsequent battery uh, set from from the some CSM three or or fix in situ the battery set from two? That's still we're still working through that. As Mr. Shatria said back in March, they are going to fix the batteries, but as of the end of April, they haven't decided which option to go with yet. There were also some interesting notes on the mission analysis that goes on regularly for these flights. One of the areas of analysis right now is launch availability which includes how many days in a launch period are available and how many hours are available to launch on a given day. One of the ways to optimize launch vehicle performance and maximize the duration of launch windows on a given day is to vary the inclination of the initial parking or insertion orbit. Shortly after liftoff, SLS will roll to a heads down attitude and orient itself to a launch heading or azimuth that targets a specific orbit inclination. Once it is beyond the lower atmosphere, the vehicle's guidance program will continually steer to stay on that heading and inclination. As the slide notes, the vehicle would overfly the Bermuda area for a range of launch azimuths. Avoiding those trajectories would create either a cutout in the headings for the launch window or would create one of the boundaries for allowable headings. There was some discussion in the meeting about the heat shield investigation, and somewhat coincidentally, the NASA Inspector General Office released the report of a long audit they did throughout most of 2023 that goes farther into background details on that. The OIG report is definitely something to go over in more detail, but in a future video. The NASA response to the OIG report raised eyebrows for different reasons, but focusing on planning and preparations, it provided a little context to the discussion in the April 26 briefing. The heat shield investigation is an all internal activity. The investigators would be presenting their findings to the technical authorities for review, and then a recommendation would go to the Orion Program Control Board, possibly in this month in May. An independent team would also review the investigation's reports in May, and NASA's current estimate is that they will complete the investigation by the end of June. The briefing to the NAC HEO committee provided more detail about the process, particularly while the investigation focuses only on the root cause. As noted, other groups are independently looking at how the addition of re-entry trajectory constraints could also affect launch availability. We are making sure that we're independent of the, the findings of that investigation, which will, which will dictate a lot of our Reentry constraints, assuming we believe that the 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 we we have a, a valid case for limited use disposition of that heat shield, we we're, we are make, making sure analytically that we can tolerate any any amount of downrange constraints in terms of the mitigations required for heat load and heat rate on that on that heat shield that will come out of that investigation. Yeah, the question was about the heat shield. I imagine the stressor cases, the return from the moon, not any abort scenario. Is that right? Stressor cases are, yeah, primarily a high speed lunar return. Yeah. And 
you know, and, and high speed lunar return when the horizontal target line induces like a really maximal heat duration. Um, you know, well, a lot of what the investigation is looking at is not only that return capability that we that we demonstrated on one, but also the impacts of the skip reentry trajectory had on the performance of the ablator. So all of that is is there. You know, so we're looking at all of the direct entry trajectories. You know, ballistic return, of course, is enveloping in some cases, and then the direct entry capability. But you know, Mike, the, the important part of that investigation is let's not. We we have tried very hard all the way up, and I think culture. This has been. A really big success all the way up to the administrator has said, do not worry about building flight rationale when you start looking at this heat shield. Make sure you understand the fundamental physics of what's happening in terms of the ablator, how the ablator is kind of is, 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 is performing the resin chemistry, how that's impacting the entire acreage of the heat shield. Make sure we can reproduce every inch of that in tests. We had the full scale test for one. We have been, we've been doing subscale tests at, at Wright Pat, at Ames, you know, all over the place to make sure we, we can reproduce. Kind of the the fundamental physics of that, we're getting close to the final answer in terms of that cause. What we have the analysis teams off doing is saying, okay, independent of what the constraints are going to be, what can we tolerate? If we have a constraint on on heat load or heat return, what's the what can we tolerate in all corner cases of the box, and how will that affect our our launch availability? That, that's kind of the and then when we stitch it all together, you know, we'll either have a we'll either have flight rationale or we won't. But um, that's that's kind of the, that's been the basic approach. Coming back to my watch items list, we're still waiting for more clarity on the timing of the other near-term milestones here. As noted, Orion has completed the first round of testing in the altitude chamber, and the next round is planned for July. The digital motor controller issue fixes should be installed soon, and we're still waiting to see about the battery issue fixes and heat shield investigation results. The schedule question is whether Orion assembly and test can be completed by the last quarter of this year and handed over to EGS for launch processing. That will likely drive how NASA schedules the rest of launch preparations. We'll be watching to see if Mobile Launcher 1 rolls off the pad in the second half of June. That's about eight weeks from now. VAB High Bay 3 is the integration cell where SLS and Orion are stacked on the Mobile Launcher and there's about a month worth of preps for the ML once it rolls into the VAB to get ready to stack. Of course, that's the question, when will stacking begin? The process starts with the solid rocket booster segments, specifically the aft assemblies. That would also drive the schedule for when core stage two would be delivered to KSC from Michoud Assembly Facility in New Orleans, and also the LVSA that's in storage at the Marshall Space Flight Center in Huntsville, Alabama. Thanks as always for watching. Let me know if you liked this video. Coming up, I'll go over what was covered in the presentations about Artemis 3 and 4 planning, development, and construction.